Praise the Lord. We're having a great time, haven't we? We'll stand up as we pray together. Our Father, we thank you very much for this blessed moment of hearing your word. Thank you for bringing us to the climax, the conclusion of the whole thing this year. And we pray, Lord, you'll make a mark in every heart, every life, in Jesus' name. And we pray that as we're going out, we'll do exploits for the glory of the Lord. And souls will be won in their thousands and millions in Jesus' name. Touch lives through us this year. Transform lives through us this year. And turn many people around in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, to be fruitful Christians, fruitful ministers, fruitful churches, so that, Lord, the name of Christ will be lifted up. Great will be the harvest into the kingdom. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Thank you very much. You can sit down. We thank the Lord who has brought us to the conclusion or the climax, the culmination of everything as we come to the end of the convention this year. And as you are going back home, what word are you taking back home? Obviously, you want to know what's in the heart and the mind of Christ. What's the most important thing to Christ? Not to me. Not to you. Not to deeper life as a church. Not even to the people of the world. If we were to ask Christ right now, at this time, and say, what is the number one thing on your mind? So that... The church of Christ, the body of Christ, and the believers will be able to concentrate on that one single thing. You'll find that in Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 36. But when he saw the multitudes, you'll find the multitudes there in the plural. They had come from various places. In all the cities and the villages and the regions around. And now he saw them. And he's still looking at the multitudes today. The multitudes in our big cities, mega cities. And the multitudes in the various states in this union. And the multitudes within the United States and the whole of the West. And then the third world. He's looking at the multitudes in the whole world. He wants to broaden and brighten your vision. To see beyond what you see today. And to think beyond what you are thinking of today. He was moved with compassion on them. The Bible says that the mind of Christ. When you see with the eyes of Christ. And you feel with the very mind of Christ. And you reason the way Christ reasons. You'll put this one in the front burner. That means you'll make this as number one. He was moved with compassion on them. Because they fainted and they were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then says he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous. What do you think about that? At the time of Jesus Christ, we're told the population of the whole world was just about 250 million. That means a quarter of a billion. Right now, at this time, the population of the world has gone beyond 6 billion people. And if he thought at that time, and he said at that time, the harvest truly is plenteous. For 250 million people. In the land of Israel at that time, it was just about between 3 and 5 million people. The land of Israel at that time. And if you said the population was so great at that time, that the harvest is plenteous and the laborers few. What will he be saying today? As he looks at even the city in which we are, the population of this city alone, is greater than the whole of the nation of Israel at the time of Jesus Christ. And if he said that the harvest truly is plenteous, very great, but the laborers are few, what do you think he'll be saying today? Feel the mind of Christ and see how Christ is seen and put as number one what Christ puts as number one. 
Then he said, the church has a responsibility. The disciples have a responsibility. The apostles, they gather together. They have a responsibility. What's that? In verse, in verse 38, pray ye, therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. At the time of Jeremiah, God had a controversy with the children of Israel. What was that? In Jeremiah chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 24. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 24. Neither said they in their heart. That was a controversy. The Lord was looking at the whole nation. And was looking at the prophets and the priests of that time. And looking at the children of Israel, those who said he knew the Lord at that time. And he said, I'm wondering for these children of Israel, I'm concerned about them. They are not, they are not saying the right thing in their heart. I have a controversy with my people. What's that? They didn't say, neither, neither say they in their heart. Let us now fear the Lord our God. That giveth the rain, both the former and the latter. In his season, he reserves unto us the appointed weeks of the harvest. The Lord was concerned about them. That they were not thinking about the harvest. And they were not thinking that God has preserved us, kept us alive at this time. And is reserving for us the appointed weeks of the harvest. Obviously then, the Lord wants us to be thinking about the harvest. The harvest of souls. A great harvest. And Jesus said, pray ye to the Lord of the harvest. That he will send forth laborers into his harvest field. As we round up the convention this year, we're talking about praying and planning. Not only praying, but planning as well. Not only planning, but praying together with the planning. Praying and planning for a great harvest. We're going to have a great harvest. And my time will come another time. I don't think this place will contain us again. Because it's going to be a great, great harvest. But you know, this kind of a message is not a motivational message, so to say. You know, sometimes you can be stirred up have all the fire, then you don't know what the steam, what you're going to do with the steam, what you're going to do with the fire. Looks like the locomotive is ready to run. What's the direction we're running? We just don't know. We're ready to get up and take the land. But which land are we going to take? We don't even understand. It's like you want to have a walking manual. It's like you want to look ahead and see. And then you want to ask yourself, what do I do? How do I do it? What's the goal? What's the dream? What's the vision? What's the destination? What do you want to achieve? And then when you know where you are going, what road will take you there? What method will take you there? And what resources do you have to get together? And what's the most economical way to make use of those resources and get to the place you are going? That's why we're talking about praying and planning. You know, if you think about the church, I don't like, uh, you know, thinking sometimes analyzing the church. I don't mean deeper life, I mean the whole body of Christ. The whole body of Christ, you know, there's a part of the body of Christ. All they do is praying. I'm saying, wait a minute, Jesus prayed, but he did more than praying. And then sometimes, another part of the church, all they do is planning, developing strategies. This is how to do this, this is how to do that. And I say, wait a minute, Moses and the children of Israel, they also plan, but they pray. You join both together. And it's when you bring those two things together, you are praying, you are planning, you are preparing, you are walking, that you are going to reach where you are going to reach, and we are going to reach there. And you have a lot of things to write. I wish I could be like a teacher this morning and just, you know, come and check your notes when I finish preaching and then mark them as you miss it this way. And if you, you know, go back over 47%, then you know that, you know, the convention is, is, is sending on a negative note for you. So pay attention, write down everything. I don't mind that today if you, you know, spy a little and say, what did he say? And put that down. We're going to have everything down. 
And then, you know, sometimes we'll come to the convention, we'll write all these notes. And then after the convention, somebody will say, praise the Lord, that thing is over, you know. We we'll woke up so early in the morning, and then we went through all that. No rest, no, no breathing space. And now I can go and sleep for, you know, the rest of the month. And then your notes, when I come to your location in uh, maybe August, or, and I said, show me your note, Brother Ernest. And then you say, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't even know where I put it now. This one, you will remember. You will work on it. And this is going to bear fruit in the church. I divide the message to how many parts am I dividing the message? Always three, always three. Number one, prevailing prayer for a great harvest. Prevailing prayer for a great harvest. Prevailing prayer for a great harvest. That's exactly what the Lord told us to do. He said we must pray. Pray to the Lord of the harvest. That he will send laborers into the harvest field. Number two, persuasive preaching for a great harvest. It takes preaching, communicating the gospel, passing it on, telling people, here is what it is. This is what saves what Christ has done on the cross of Calvary. And then number three, purposeful planning. Purposeful planning for a great harvest. Let's come back to number one. Prevailing prayer for a great harvest. As you look at Luke chapter 10, you'll see that what Jesus said before in Matthew, he says it again in Luke. In Luke chapter 10, we're looking at verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed all the seventy also. When it says, after these things, you need to begin to think now. Some things are taking place. What are those things that are taking place? You'll find that in chapter 9. When it says, after these things, obviously, the immediate antecedent to that is chapter 9. That is, some things took place in chapter 9. In chapter 9, look at verse 1. Then he called his 12 disciples together, and he gave them power and authority over all devils, and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God. The twelve had gone out. And he had preached. Not only that, he himself had preached in chapter 9. And then you come to the end of chapter 9. If you look at verse 57. Somebody said, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And as the Lord gave that individual the, the, the situation on ground, we can't find that individual anymore. And then in verse 59, he told another, follow me. And then that other fellow said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Again, we cannot see the trace, the footsteps of that individual anymore. And then in verse 61, another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, no man, having put his hands to the plow, looking back and looking back and speak for the kingdom of God. You see a lot of things that had happened in chapter 9. And now it says in chapter 10, after these things, the Lord appointed 70 others to go and preach. 12, that's not enough. Even the 70, that's not enough, you'll find out later. He sent them two by two before him into every city and place whither he himself would come. Now see what he said in verse 2. Therefore said he unto them what he had said before. That's before sending the twelve apostles out. This is what he said. Now after sending the seventy out, he's saying the same thing. The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. That means then, if we want to see the harvest coming in, souls coming in, converts being born into the kingdom of God, there's something we must do. We must pray. And this must be prevailing prayer, persevering prayer. A kind of prayer you pray, and you're almost sweating with the drops of blood like it did at Gethsemane. It, it comes from your soul, from the very depth of your being. And you want souls to be saved. 
you are praying like the apostle that he is like the apostle um, that's uh, Paul in Romans chapter 10 Romans chapter 10 reading from verse 1 brethren my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved I'm praying is from the depth of my heart and sweating about it and it says I'm praying that Israel might be saved in fact, the way he prayed, you'll know the condition of his heart as you look at chapter 9 of Romans. Romans chapter 9, in verse 2, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. That's how he prayed. The sorrow in the heart because of his countrymen, kinsmen, that were not born again, did not know the Lord. It bothered him so much, was great, great pressure upon him that he said, my continual sorrow. The great heaviness in my heart is this. Then he said in verse 3, For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ. Separated from Christ. That if it were possible, if my getting away from the Lord will bring them to the Lord, I wouldn't mind at all. It's like a, a Moses saying, Lord, forgive them, the children of Israel, and count them your children, your inheritance again. If you will not do that, take me, my name out of the book that you have written. You see the way they prayed? You see their heart, the passion in their soul, the stirring of the heart. And you see the desire that they had, a consuming passion it was. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ, from my, uh, from Christ, for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites. Now, see, so look at some two. The prayer we are praying. You look at some two, and you're looking at verse eight. Some two, verse eight. Ask of me. Pray unto me. Plead with me. Bring your request before the Lord, he says. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. I'm sure you know that this is the father talking to his only begotten son. This is Messianic psalm. That means a psalm dedicated to the Messiah, to Christ. But we are the hands of Christ. We are now the mouth of Christ. We are now the members of the body of Christ. We are now the representatives of Christ. And as the Lord told Christ, ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for your inheritance. The Lord is telling us that on behalf of Christ, we should ask. This is the kind of prayer request the Lord has given us. And this is what we must do. That we must pray that the Lord himself will draw the heathen, the pagans, the unbelievers, the sinners, the world unto himself, so that from the uttermost part of the earth they become the possession of the Lord. Look at chapter 22 in response, in answer to that kind of prayer. Psalm 22, reading verse 27. All the ends of the, of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord and turn unto the Lord. That's the Old Testament way of describing salvation. Turn unto the Lord. That's the Old Testament way of, of talking about repentance. They'll turn unto the Lord. It's the Old Testament experience of